So this is going to be the new focus. How can we make care more affordable? Interestingly, another thing that the health care reform law does is it creates loss ratios for insurance companies. So the insurance companies will add up the total cost of care and then it can add 15 percent of that for group business. And that's the, the new premium is cost of care plus 15. In the old days, there were all kinds of factors that worked into insurance rating. There were profit margins. There were a lot of variation. There were all kinds of administrative expense issues. Multiple, very confusing set of, of uh, calculations. That's been simplified. It's been made very basic. It's cost of care plus 15. So if you think about that, what does that mean? It means that instead of focusing all the attention on the insurance side, where the political debate and the political energy and even the media energy has been for the last couple of years, the attention is now going to shift from the 15 to the 85, because 85 is going to be driving the cost of care going forward, and people are going to want to know how can we make that 15 a better number. The attention is going to flip from the insurance function to the cost function. And when you look at what we can do on cost, there's really only three basic approaches. You can ration, you can re-engineer, and you can reprice. That's the three R's of, of uh, cost containment. Um, rationing, again, is entirely wrong. It's stupid. To re when we haven't even made an effort to get care right, rationing is wrong. Re-engineering care, this room is full of people who are trying to re-engineer care. The agendas for these meetings have been about re-engineering care. Re-engineering care is the right approach. And then repricing care is something that I'm going to talk about in just a second that also needs to be part of the package. And we would be stupid and incompetent to ration before we made any effort to make care more effective or affordable. Um, <clears throat> cars don't get better or more affordable by rationing rubber and headlights. Uh, cars are a total package and cars get better by being re-engineered as a package and sold as a product, and we need to be thinking about health care in a similar way. So re-engineering key elements of care gives us a wide range of opportunities. The agendas for these meetings for the last three days have been about multiple areas where re-engineering care is possible. And I talked about a couple at KP, broken bones, uh, cutting the number of broken bones is care re-engineering, shifting, uh, taking the shift change and making it a process um, is re-engineering. Cutting the number of pressure ulcers by doing all of the right things for each patient every single time um, makes a difference and is re-engineering and saves money. Sepsis response teams, instead of having the people respond to each sepsis event by creating an emergency crash team on the fly and trying to get the right drugs and trying to get the right diagnosis done and trying to get the right uh, skill set into the room at the right time for the patient. Uh, sepsis has a golden hour. You can cut the death rate in half if you can respond within that hour. And so you have to re-engineer to get to the golden hour. And, so the, and then you save a lot of money because you don't have patients going into those really high cost sepsis crises and, and dying. The asthma follow-up, making sure that when kids are having asthma attacks, that there's a system and a process that's re-engineered to follow up. You can cut the number of subsequent asthma attacks in half if somebody knows that the kid went through the process and isn't taking their medication. And then health improvement itself, I'm going to talk about again in a second. And the re-engineering can work. This, we're re-engineering um, pressure ulcers and working with teams of caregivers to make sure every single patient gets the right care every single time, and the results have been spectacular. Um, we've had much better uh, results. In Modesto Hospital, we've had zero pressure ulcers for two full years by making re-engineering a core competency of that group. So the good news is for the country that we can make care better and cut heart attacks, kidney failures, cut readmissions, cut hospital-based infections, and they all reduce the total number amount of care needed. That's the good news. Bad news is that reducing the amount of care needed doesn't always bring down the cost of care, and the reason for that is people shift the cost to the remaining patients. And if all you get is a cost shift, then making care better is wonderful, wonderful because it makes care better. But it doesn't bring down the cost of care. Um, and the, this has been the pattern in the U.S. for a couple of decades. Let me show you some interesting 
hospital statistics, inpatient utilization in American hospitals has gone down to the point where we have the lowest utilization in the world in our hospitals. It's gone down consistently for some time. Now, if you look at these numbers and if you straight line the cost, you'd assume that the cost of, health, of hospital care in America has gone down by 20 percent over this time period. And in fact, the cost of hospital care has gone up disproportionately and now consumes more of the health care dollar than it did at the beginning of that time period because prices have gone up. Hospitals have raised prices and the price increases have more than offset the decrease in utilization. So if all we get out of an improvement in utilization is a offsetting increase in price, then the total cost of health care in America will not go down and health care will continue to be unaffordable as a country. We have to be able to get the cost benefit of care improvement as well as the care improvement. Now the urban legend, this is fascinating, the urban legend is that the reason we have problems in America is that we have too many hospital beds. How many times people have said we need to cut the number of hospital beds in America, we've got too many beds and the fact that we've got too many beds is why our care is so much more expensive than the rest of the world. They also say that we're getting too many office visits, we're getting too much medical care and the, the problem in this country is excessive care and actually I would say that's probably wrong. Um, what's true about the quantity of American health care, if you look at the Commonwealth data, the Commonwealth does some wonderful comparative data uh, for places around the world. If you look at the Commonwealth data, if you look at the, the spending on, on hospital cost for America, yes, our spending is way at the high end. And I'm going to show you some other prices in a minute, but it's way at the high end. If you look at the number of acute beds per population, we're at the very bottom. We have fewer beds than anybody in the world as a country. When you look at the hospital days per capita, we're at the very bottom. We have fewer hospital days per capita, we have fewer hospital, the problem isn't that we have too many beds. Uh, that's an urban legend. But the problem is, is that as we've been bringing down the utilization, we've seen an incredible increase in unit price and its price. The same thing on physician costs. When you look at physician costs in America compared to any other country, we are sitting way at the high end per capita physician cost. When you look at the average number of physician visits for Americans, we're at the, the very low end. When you look at the ability of Americans to get a same day physician appointment, um, did I go past that one? Okay, I didn't have that one in here. The same day physician appointment, if you could see this slide, you'd, you'd see that we are at the very, very end. Um, in the Netherlands, 60 percent of the patients get same-day appointment. New Zealand, 54 percent. United Kingdom, 48 percent. U.S., 26. We're running at less than half the national average, so or the international average. So if that's true, we have fewer admissions, we have fewer medical visits, we have uh, slower access to many levels of care. How come health care is 17 percent of the GDP here and less than 10 elsewhere? And the answer is uh, fees. If you look at an office visit um, in Canada, it's $39. They pay 39 bucks in the Canadian single payer system. If you charge 40 in Canada, you lose your license to practice. They're very strict. You cannot take a dollar on the side from a patient and you lose your license to practice. If you look at the U.S., it's a multiple of that is the average fee in some places are four and five times as much as they charge in Canada. So the difference between us and the rest of the world in terms of cost is fees. And, and uh, if you look at the fees there, it's true across the board. C-sections, we are way higher. France is 4,300. Uh, the U.S., 95th percentile is 21,000. So we don't get more care. What do we get? We get higher price care and prices of each unit of care are much higher in the U.S. And I don't have time to go through all these slides. I was actually going to talk about a couple of them, but if you look at total physician costs for an appendectomy or a hip replacement or bypass, a cabbage, the cabbage numbers are fascinating because most of Europe does cabbages for under 20,000 
our average is 60, and we do them for up to way over 100. But the cost of camp, same outcome, same results, same survival rate, and fraction of the cost. Angioplasties, uh, very different costs, angiograms. Uh, CT scans are fascinating because CT scans, same equipment, same technology, same training, same outcome, everything is the same, and yet the costs in the U.S. are way over the costs anyplace else in the world. Same thing of MRI scans. And the same thing of prescription drugs. Now, everybody knows the prescription drug data because they've had congressional hearings on the fact that the drug companies charge more in the U.S. Uh, what they didn't talk about is the fact that we actually, the drug companies look like they're giving us a good deal compared to our cabbage prices. So the drug companies have been practicing price restraint um, compared to the rest of the healthcare market. Uh, these are fascinating numbers. So what does that say? How, how important are the fee levels to the total cost of care? If we've delivered all of the care that we delivered in the U.S. today, every single piece, every test, every procedure, every surgery, every hospital day, and we repriced at the Canadian levels, we would drop the percentage of GDP spent on care from 17.5 to 11.5 percent, in which case care would be entirely affordable. If you look at Canadian data, cost of a HIST replacement here is double depression, Piccany, it's much higher. What about the insurance costs? Everybody talks about the single payer system. If we took the Canadian insurance expense and put that into the U.S., and use the single payer insurance expense, but kept every single unit cost of care that we have now in the U.S. So did all of the U.S. fees that we do now, but went to the Canadian insurance cost, we would drop from 17.6 to 16.5. So we would get a reduction in total cost of care by using the Canadian insurance cost, but it's a fraction of what we would get by using Canadian fees. And that data is based on the Commonwealth Fund uh, data showing that we do spend quite a bit more on insurance in this country than um, other countries in the world. So if you look at hospital charges and the average cost per day in the U.S., you see numbers that are way, way, way higher. Now the challenge is, for us, healthcare creates great jobs. It's a really important part of the economy. It fuels local economies. It's the number one employer in most settings. It protects our economic base. Cutting fees to European levels or to Canadian levels would be devastating to our economy. It would be like taking what's left of our auto industry and cutting it in half. Um, it doesn't, the answer is not. And, don't, and as we go forward and try to figure this out, we're not going to go forward and figure it out by cutting to Canadian levels because that cannot be done. But what we can do is we can now start thinking about fees as part of the equation and think about fees as part of the cost solution and stop thinking of fees as being inherently inflexible. Uh, one of the really fascinating things when you look at the CBO percentages going forward as they project the cost of care into the future, they always assume that whatever fee schedule is in place right now is absolutely, totally legitimate and can't be changed and must be projected forward even though the range in the U.S. of those fees is a multiple of a couple they still assume that every single one of them, in terms of CBO rationale, is inflexible and that you can't deal with fees as a mechanism for getting to the outcome through any market mechanism. So we need to start adding, since fees are the number one cost driver, we need to start looking at fees as something that could be done and work within the fee range we already have. Um, and I'll make one other point on fees. If we took the subsidized people in the exchanges, and paid the subsidized population at something that would be Medicare plus 10 or some uh, Medicare-based fee schedule instead of the full American fees. Right now, the major cost, of, major cost of reform is the amount of money needed to provide those subsidies. If we, and so there's a tax, there's an insurance tax that every American is going to be paying in 2014 that is based on the need to get money for those subsidies. If we simply repriced, we wouldn't need the tax. The repricing more than eliminates 
the tax. So the, that entire tax could go away if we looked at uh, repricing care at some level for the people in the exchange. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about using the French model of fees, but I think I'm going to go forward. What the French do is they basically set a base fee, and anyone who wants to pay more can pay more, but the base fee is the, base, is the fee that's in the insurance premium. And so there's a solidarity factor to that as well. And if you want to spend more, you can, but you spend it out of your own money. In the U.S., we have a deductible, so everybody pays the thousand. And then if you want to go someplace that costs ten thousand or twenty thousand, you transfer that to everybody else's premium by having your insurance company pay it. So the French flip it over. The French model have price competition, and if we use something more closely resembling the French model, uh, we would see a very different model. And price competition would happen overnight in this country. And I would just, on that one, just mention LASIK eye surgery. LASIK eye surgery used to cost 2000 then it went to 1500 Now, in many cases, down to 500 All the caregivers re-engineered care. And why did they re-engineer care? Because it wasn't a covered service, and people paid out of pocket. And so very bright people, people in healthcare are just as smart as anybody else relative to re-engineering. People in healthcare re-engineered the cost of LASIK surgery, brought the cost down. And if we would have covered LASIK surgery with a thousand dollar deductible, it would still cost three. It wouldn't cost three, it cost 3.4 because they would, the price would have gone up every year and it wouldn't have gotten better. So, and when we look at benefits, we need to eliminate the deductible for people with chronic conditions because we need people with chronic conditions to get their care from patient focused care teams who follow basic protocols. And that's incredibly important work. Um, I actually want to get to uh, one other topic, and I think I'm going to uh, go to it more quickly. Um, we need smart exchanges, and we need people, consumers, able to make uh, important decisions about their care. And if we have data about better cancer care in the exchanges, I guarantee that everybody's cancer care will get better. We've never tried market forces on health care. If we show people that if you've got stage three cancer and you go to this clinic, you live on average five years, and if you go to this clinic, you live on average two years, and those kinds of differences exist, then the clinics where you live two years will get better. Market forces will make care better. Market forces that involve prices will make care more affordable. Market forces that involve making care better. And we don't have to identify every single thing. We need to identify about 10 medical conditions that are really relevant to us and make that information. We also need team care. We need people who have deductibles to lose the deductible and not have to pay the deductible if they get their care from a team. So we need to structure the care delivery benefit package around the patient and not just around actuaries or accountants. It's time to have a medically based benefit package and that actually saves a lot of money. So as we're trying to save care. The last topic I'm going to talk about and I'm just going to touch on this is health. We need population health. 75% of the cost of care comes from uh, chronic conditions. And the chronic conditions are caused by obesity and inactivity and smoking. And the smoking rate we're dealing with, um, and there's some improvement there. Obesity is really, really hard because food is good, people like to eat, diets are hard, everything done on obesity is really challenging. So we need to make healthy food available, we need to get rid of trans fats, we need to get rid of of saturated fats. We need to do a whole bunch of things in our diet to make healthier eating happen. When those agendas are hard. But what we really need to do is focus on the third problem. And the third problem is inactivity. And inactivity is where all the opportunity is. It's where all the leverage is. It's where we can actually make a difference in a very real way in a relatively short time. And we need to get to activity levels that are higher. And the activity levels that are higher just need to be walking. The beauty is we don't have to run. We don't have to do aerobics. You don't need a personal trainer. What you need is to walk. If you walk 30 minutes a day, four days a week, 
the rate of becoming diabetic is cut in half, literally cut in half. Walking also reduces the number of strokes, it reduces the number of heart attacks, it reduces the number of congestive heart failure patients, it has a very positive impact on depression. Walking actually has a more th better therapeutic impact on slowing the progression of Alzheimer's than any of the prescriptions available. There are good studies showing that walking is almost magical. The human body was designed to walk, it was made to walk. Every country in the world where people urbanize and stop walking has a massive influx, massive growth in the number of diabetics in the country and chronic conditions. The human body is made to walk. Walking works really well. And so what we need to do is have a national agenda of walking. Walking is very basic, and the beauty of the walking science, the new science of walking, is showing us that that 30 minutes a day that cuts the number of diabetics in half. Now, we're in a path for 40% for of the people in this country to be diabetic if we stay on the trajectory we're on. We can cut the number of new diabetics in half if people walk, and the beauty is it doesn't have to be 30 minutes, uninterrupted 30 minutes. It can be two 15s. Two 15s work just as well. Two 15, two brisk walks, 15 minutes, has the same therapeutic impact as 130. So if you think about 215s, how liberating that is to your agenda. You can walk 15 in the morning, 15 at night. You can take coffee breaks. Instead of coffee breaks, you can take walking breaks. You can take walk at noon. The opportunity to walk is huge. The benefits of walking is huge. We need this entire country to be walking. We need to make create safe walking. Marine in her opening uh, remarks had this lovely uh, slide from Sweden of the, the walking school buses. The walking school buses are exactly the right thing to do. That's incredibly important uh, thing to do. And we are now seeing in several American cities some schools beginning to do walking school buses. But we need to make communities safe for walking. We need walking to be in the agenda. And we need Americans to be walking. And it's that basic. It's that simple. It's the only thing we can do to change population health that has any meaningful chance of success. Oh, there are a couple walking school buses in America. Um, it's the only thing that can possibly work. And so we need to get refocused on that. When you think programmatically and systematically, when you think from the perspective of process improvement and total population health, and what are the things you can do that actually have enough leverage to get us to actually have better health, walking is the sweet spot. Walking is the thing we need to do. So I'm, I'm here to strongly encourage walking. We're going to be encouraging walking for our members. We're encouraging walking for our employees. We're going to be encouraging walking for the country. We're going to try to create tools and support groups for walking. We're going to try to get the science out. And we're going to try to transmit information about walking. Because if we don't improve population health, we're going to have a completely unaffordable health care system in this country. And we need to do better. It's the only really good option we have. So I encourage you to improve care and walk. Thank you very much.